we'll be continuing with our first panel of the day, fairness, accountability, and transparency in algorithmic decision making. We have one of the leading scholars in, in the world on this topic uh, moderate and speak. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sharad Guell. Again, yeah, so please settle in, and there's plenty, if you didn't find a chair before, there's uh, plenty here in the front. And again, if there's a, if you see a, an evaluation form on the chair that doesn't, on the seat, that doesn't mean that the seat is taken. So we just left them there for you to grab one and fill out and submit it when you leave the room. All right. Over to you, Shura. Yep. Hi, welcome. I'm uh, Shard Goyle, and I'll be moderating this panel. So as algorithms and AI have been increasingly integrated into the legal system, a couple core questions are always asked. Do we understand how these algorithms actually work, and are they fair? And often the answer is we don't understand how these algorithms work. And because of that, we often can't determine whether or not they are fair. And so we'll be discussing both of these, both of these issues on this panel. I'll be kicking it off by talking a little bit about how we can measure and define fairness. Uh, Brian Casey, a law student uh, here, is going to be talking about some of the pretty interesting ways in which ethical questions come up in the deployment of these types of algorithms. And Bean Kim, a research scientist at Google Brain, will be discussing how we can make and, and how we can make simple interpretable algorithms to understand how they're working. So as you all probably know, risk assessment tools are being used by judges across the uh, country now when they're trying to assess the likelihood that a defendant is, is, uh, is likely to fail to appear at trial or commit a violent crime um, if they're released. And so this is a pretty high stakes decision where judges have to, you know, they, they have in these relatively quick proceedings, somebody's arrested, now they have to decide, am I gonna release this defendant on their own recognizance? Am I gonna set bail? Am I gonna detain them? And in an effort to improve this process, these algorithms are being turned to. Now, in theory, these are great. In theory, we know that statistical algorithms can improve upon human judgments. Uh, but in practice, there are, there are a lot of worries. And in particular, this, this article that I, I suspect many of you have seen that, that came out um, a couple years ago, was done by ProPublica, and, and this, this title pretty much says it all, Machine Bias, their software used across the country to predict future criminals, and it's biased against blacks. So if this is true, this is quite serious, and this is not a hypo hypo hypothetical. These algorithms are actually being deployed across courtrooms um, in the nation, and so we have to understand, is there some sort of unfairness issue, some bias built into these algorithms? Now, how do they determine whether or not, where's this claim coming from? They did something quite interesting. They looked at 3,000 white and black defendants who were assigned these compass risk scores in Broward County, Florida. And not only did they determine the score, but also whether these defendants recidivated. So they followed them for two years and determined what ultimately happened. Did they, did they commit a violent crime while released? And the key statistic is, is this. They found that about among defendants who did not ultimately go on to reoffend. 31% of black defendants were deemed high risk by the algorithm, and 15% of white defendants were deemed high risk by the algorithm. So again, this is a pretty striking statistic. So again, let me repeat it one more time. Among defendants who did not go on to reoffend, so after, after the fact, we looked and we saw, did they ultimately go on to reoffend? Twice as many black defendants were rated high risk by the algorithm versus white defendants. And remember, being rated high risk by the algorithm means that you suffer the consequences, that you're more likely to be detained by the judge, the more likely to have bail amount, high bail amount set, and so this is a pretty big deal. Okay? Now this uh, statistic felt pretty, I would say, viscerally bad to a lot of people, and let me just see, how many people have seen this statistic before? How many people think this is really bad? A lot of people. So I'm gonna try to persuade you in five minutes that you shouldn't feel so bad about this statistic. And, and this is an example of why it's so difficult to determine whether or not an algorithm is biased. Um, so I apologize, it's a little bit early in the morning for algebra, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try to keep it friendly and just use pictures. Um, so suppose this is what the world looked like. So this is a stylized example, but it's pretty close to what's actually going on in, in Broward County. So we have two groups, the blue group and the orange group. 
And those numbers underneath them, uh, those are just kind of the, the risk assessments that the algorithm is producing. And so we can see that the high risk people are on the right, the low risk people are on the left, the blue group is not the same as the orange group, and so they have a different you know, risk scores, that's, that's reasonable. We take any two groups, they're gonna have different risk scores. And now that dotted line there, that's where we're just gonna say, these are the people who are quote unquote high risk versus low risk. There's just some binary distinction between these two groups, so we're just gonna say high risk and low risk. So very similar to Broward County. Good? Okay, so now let's just focus on the blue group first. And we wanna understand the false positive rate. This is that statistic that I just showed you before. Among people who did not go on to reoffend how many were rated high risk? So among people who did not go on to reoffend, how many are on the right side of that dashed line? So I'll spare you the algebra and just show you in pictures, it's about two over eight in this picture, or 25%. Okay, so this is a 25% false positive rate. You can sum up those numbers. I won't make you do it, no quizzes, don't worry about it. Um, but this is the answer, about 25%. Good, so so far, so good. Let's do the same thing with the orange group, okay? We're gonna do the exact same thing. Among people who did not go on to reoffend, how many were rated high risk? We do the same thing, we have about two and a half on the top now, we have six on the bottom, 42%. And so this is where we started out. This is more or less the, the case of, 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 uh, of Compass in Broward County, no sleight of hand yet. I'm just kind of reviewing their argument that false positive rate for the blue group is much lower than the false positive rate for the orange group. So it seems reasonable to conclude that the algorithm is biased against people in the orange group. Good, so far so good. Everyone is convinced this is a biased algorithm. So now pay close attention. What's gonna happen? Let's look at the orange group again. Now let's say that you are, you know, you're a judge in this jurisdiction, you're the police in this jurisdiction, you're like, hey, we don't really like this fact that people think that we're biased. So why don't we fix this problem, but it's too much work to actually change what we're gonna do. So what do we do? Let's just start arresting and releasing a bunch of college protesters. We, we know that they're low risk, so we don't need to detain them. We'll just arrest them, and then we're gonna let them go. So what's gonna happen now? What's gonna happen to our false positive rate if we just arrest a bunch of college protesters and immediately release them? Well, they're low risk people, so what's gonna happen? Well, the top is the same, the number of people who Reoffend and are actually detained or ra actually rated high risk, well, that doesn't change because we're gonna release all these extra people we arrested. The only thing that's gonna change is the denominator. Because now all of a sudden, there are many people who don't go on to reoffend. I mean, they're all college protesters. None of them are gonna go on and reoffend. Well, maybe they'll protest some more, but they'll, for the most part, they're not gonna reoffend. And so we're just gonna increase that denominator, and all of a sudden, our false positive rate is low. So now it looks like we're fair. We went from unfair to fair, and all we had to do was arrest and release a bunch of college protesters. <laughs> okay, so that's clearly not good. And again, this is, you know, this is not too far from the core problem of false positive rates, is that of course no one is gonna actually carry out this strategy, but what this example demonstrates is the fact we should be extremely suspicious of using false positive rates as an argument that the algorithm is fundamentally unfair, because it's extremely easy to game. And even if you're not trying to game it, if in fact you just happen to be doing this, if you happen to be arresting relatively low risk people, then your false positive rates could give you a misleading impression of what's fundamentally going on. So now, this is just to say that the argument was wrong. It's not to say that the algorithm is fair. And I wanna make this distinction, and it's a pretty important distinction, that, that we often don't know how algorithms work, and this is a problem, so it's very hard for us to definitively understand whether or not they're fair, but we do know that some of these arguments for saying that they're fair or not are problematic. And that was the point of, what I, of, the, of this example. So let me give you another example of where we think that things are unfair. So this is St. George's Hospital in the UK. It's a real example. We developed an algorithm to sort medical school um, applications. This is a pretty hard you know, thing, laborious thing to do. Um, and so instead of actually having humans go through all these applications one by one, they trained an algorithm to mimic their past decisions. You know, I'm, I'm on the search committee, I do all this, I would love to have an algorithm that would just go through all the applications, spare me the time to read them, and determine who is actually a good applicant. So it seems like it's a great idea. You know, now all of a sudden an algorithm can do my job. What could be better than that? It turns out that this was an incredibly bad idea. 
So why is that? Well, past decisions were biased against women and minorities. And so all we did was codify that discrimination. We made it look like the algorithm is doing a perfectly fair thing. In fact, all it's really doing is doing what the human was doing, but the human wasn't particularly fair. So we codified discrimination. There was arguably this veneer of objectivity because we pushed the human out of the loop, made an algorithm make these types of decisions, but in fact, we've only made the problem worse. So what's going on in Broward County? Well, we don't know, but one thing that we worry about is that we don't actually know who commits crimes. We don't actually know who reoffends. The only thing that we know is who's ultimately rearrested or potentially who's ultimately convicted. And so there's this mismatch between the observed outcome and the outcome that we fundamentally care about. And if you take an extreme example of something like arrest for minor drug use, we know from survey data that whites and blacks use drugs at relatively the same rate, but arrests for blacks are significantly skewed. And so you're much more likely to be arrested if you're a minority for minor drug use than if you're white. Now, if we're trying to predict, if the algorithm is trying to predict who is arrested for these types of offenses, well, it's gonna predict who's arrested for these types of offenses. It's not telling you who actually committed these types of offenses. And so this is called measurement error, and again, we have to be pretty worried about that. Now, jurisdictions are aware of this, and, and some are trying to move away from things like arrest or minor drug use and focus on violent crime, where we believe that mismatch is, is less pronounced, but again, we don't actually know if this works in practice. <coughs> okay, so what should we do? What can we do? Well, algorithms are very good at doing what you tell them to do. If you tell them, predict what is, this, what is gonna happen to this individual if I were to take this course of action, they can tell you that. What's gonna happen is, well, are they gonna be arrested? Are they not gonna be arrested? But they're not gonna tell you, are they actually committing this crime? And they're certainly not gonna tell you what else you might do. Maybe you should actually end money bail altogether. Maybe you should provide more robust pretrial services. Maybe you should provide transportation vouchers to help people get to their trial dates. Maybe you should provide text messages to remind them to get to their trial dates. The algorithm isn't gonna tell you this. And so we have to remember that algorithms are good at what they're good at, and they're incredibly bad at everything else. And so we as policymakers have to take, up, take that role. Okay, so I'll end with that, thank you. All right, so um, I am Brian Casey. Um, I'm a Codex Fellow here at Stanford, um, and I'm going to be at the Center for Automotive Research next year. Um, and we're gonna take some of those same kind of lessons that um, Cher had brought up in this context and sort of migrate them into one of the um, very hyped algorithmic bias areas of recent days, um, the autonomous vehicle space. Um, so, just by way of a little bit of background, um, accident law is um, a massive, massive area that very few people under, uh, understand is going on at quite the scale it is in the US right now, simply by virtue of the fact that so many tragic ap accidents happen so often um, in the US. And compensation for these accidents happens in the orbit of basically formal tort and insurance law. Um, but the sheer scale and complexity of these types of accidents uh, have forced the legal system, uh, since the horseless carriage was invented in uh, 1896 or so, um, to routinize the way that we compensate people who get into accidents. Um, and this formula has become pretty straightforward over time. You look at um, economic losses, um, typically, and then non-economic losses that look like pain and suffering. Um, and so once fleets of autonomous vehicles owned by a few major players um, are doing this at scale, they're going to be the ultimate repeat players in this space. And they're gonna have to be very cognizant of what the compensation costs of their autonomous vehicles look like in the event of an accident. Um, 
And so this is the, this is the big social trade-off of the last 100 years in this area. We know that we could reduce all accident tragedies to virtually zero if we set every speed limit across the country to one mile per hour. Um, <laughs> We also know that people like to get places a little bit faster than one mile per hour. Um, and it's an incredibly fraught trade-off that our society's been struggling with basically for uh, the last 100 years. Um, and so autonomous vehicles that are trying to navigate some of these complexities tend to do so through a risk management system. And what a risk management system looks like from the patents that have been filed in this space um, is that they assign a likelihood uh, as well as a positive or negative magnitude to a particular outcome. And then they look at the, um, they look at the cumulative costs of all the, all the expected negative or positive outcomes in a space. And they weigh the costs and benefits, and then they execute the decision that optimizes those costs and benefits. Um, and for all the lawyers in the room, that looks surprisingly similar to what you learned in your first year of law school, which is Carol Towing, uh, Han's famous formula of negligence, actually. Um, but unlike Han's formula, which sort of looks at these costs in their, in their sum total, um, the companies are going to look at the ones that they internalize, not necessarily the ones that society externalizes. And so what this looks like in practice from the patents that have been filed in this space, like I mentioned earlier, this is a patent from Google um, looking at how it positions itself in a lane um, as it is passing a large truck on one side and a smaller vehicle on the other side. Um, and what this system does is it positions itself slightly closer to the smaller vehicle as it's passing between two vehicles because in the event of an accident, you want to be in a, you're less likely to experience as severe a negative event if you're in a collision with a smaller vehicle as opposed to a semi-truck. And so you look at the expected risks of an action you, uh, and you look for the best one in that space and then you try and execute that decision. Um, and from a legal liability perspective, this means that as the expected compensation costs begin to go up, the firms that are programming these things are going to care more and more about liability. Um, so an accident where payouts could be in the hundreds of thousands is going to create a lot of internal incentives to make sure that you're getting these decisions right. And so what that will mean is, again, you'll kind of have a hand formula going on within these cars, and they'll be trying to maximize the best decision. And the optimal outcome will look like a kind of raw law and economic analysis of this area. Um, you have these ex-ante costs of trying to prevent these things, but they're going to be weighed against um, the ex-post costs of liability, and you're finally just going to have to settle on an optimal point in the curve where you've done as much as you can to prevent these sorts of accidents, and you have to just take the liability where it lies to simply deploy these systems. And so we tried to put that principle into practice, myself and a colleague at the uh, Center for Automotive Research named John Alsterda. And uh, we looked at the, the reward for these systems in terms of the amount of rides they can deliver in a certain amount of time, which would be a measure of velocity, essentially, um, against expected liabilities in the event of an accident. And you see a pedestrian, you have a, prob you have a probability that you've recognized a pedestrian, and then you also have a probability that a pedestrian might enter into the path of the autonomous vehicle, um, and all of those are gonna be weighed against negative event magnitudes of a potential injurious accident. Um, and if you're trying to look at how much the compensation might be, um, features that might be predictive in this area are median income household levels, um, or median household income, excuse me. Um, and this is where things begin to get a little bit worrisome. So if you are driving around in an upper crust Silicon Valley neighborhood and you get into an accident, the likely compensation that you're gonna owe to that family just by virtue of the way that the legal system currently operates is going to be significantly higher than you would expect in a inner city neighborhood, for example. 
And so what does that translate to into behavior? Well, so you can begin to pr price the expected negative event outcomes of an accident, and you can look for that optimizing position uh, by running a simulation of a pedestrian entering into the path of an autonomous vehicle as the autonomous vehicle is trying to deliver as many rides as possible while minimizing risk. Um, and you actually see that if it's taking just the single variable into account, median neighborhood income, um, you would expect to see it going slightly faster in low income neighborhoods um, than in middle income neighborhoods and then in high income neighborhoods. And so when you start to map this, these, these same income figures onto other uh, protected group demographics, such as race, um, you can see how these kind of outcomes would begin to look very, very problematic. Um, and so this is, the, this is the actual reality of how this, this famous uh, trolley pro problem is going to play out in the real world. So it's not that the vehicle isn't going to be deciding which person to kill. Uh, in the same way that you pull a switch and decide whether to save five or one person, it's going to be going slightly faster in a particular area. And if you run that scenario a million times, it's going to result in foreseeable injuries. Um, and they're going to be weighed against trade-offs like speed and customer experience and all, and, and all those kinds of factors. And so what does that mean? Well, so if we, pr if we codify our laws into machines and don't change them, um, they're going to take us literally. It's the, it's the kind of King Midas paradox. Um, Humans don't take these things literally. We're not making these kinds of hand formulas as we go down the road. Um, but machines can only be programmed to do so. Um, and so how do you prevent these kinds of things um, from, from uh, resulting in these really problematic outcomes? Well, the, the upside is that if you, get the, if you get the laws right, then you can get fantastic behavior in a way that isn't possible in the human context. Um, so if you set a speed limit, uh, you can know with almost certainty that a certain amount of humans are going to reliably break the speed limit. If you set it in the autonomous vehicles context and you put a really high penalty for violating it, you can know with almost uh, uh, virtual certainty that they won't violate it. Um, and so we're beginning to see some really fantastic innovation in this area, looking at how to open up these things from researchers um, on the outside and begin to see how these things are operating in practice. Um, you're beginning to see some fantastic collaborations, uh, like some of them we witnessed here, where lawyers are combining with computer scientists to better understand how these algorithms will work in practice and what their legal implications will be. Um, and you're beginning to see new calls for legal design practices. Um, so the GDPR is probably the most pressing example as it's about to come into effect in May. Um, and you're, you're seeing a public demand for some amount of explainability in this space. Um, but that too will have to be weighed against um, performance hits that some of these technologies can make if you impose really, really strict uh, explainability requirements and also just um, the need to get these really socially beneficial technologies out into the world uh, without stifling innovation. Um, so with that, I'll sort of leave it there. Thank you very much. I'm Bean Kim. I'm a research scientist at Google Brain. I work on how to make machine learning models more understandable by humans and coming from machine learning perspectives. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how the interpretability landscape look like in the machine learning research and some of the work that I've been working on. So my research agenda is interpretability. We need this to use machine learning more responsibly. And what that means is to we want to ensure that models reflect our values, such as fairness, and also know our knowledge, domain expert knowledge that machine learning models or data may not have is appropriately reflected. 
So I'm probably preaching to the choir by motivating this problem, but it's important to know why exactly we need interpretability. It is because we have fundamental underspecification in the problem. Uh, like Bryson, uh, Brian, sorry. <laughs> Brian just talked about that machines take this law, the optimization function or the cost function that you wrote down literally. So then the question is, can we write down the function that we really want to optimize? The answer is not very often. And what that means is that you can get all the data you want or you can make the algorithm more clever, then that's, but that's not going to help you very much. So let me be more a little more concrete. What do I mean? Think about safety. We, Brian, Brian talked about uh, building safer, uh, more fair autonomous cars. What does it mean to build a really safe autonomous car? Can we write down every single scenario that this car might may, may encounter, which that once an autonomous car passes those tests, we can give it a giant stamp and say, yes, you're safe. We can't write down all the laws and tests uh, that, that this car may encounter. So it's fundamentally underspecified. Science. Machine learning has been widely used in science to discover something new. We want to discover something new so we don't really know what that new thing is because if you have, then we wouldn't be doing this in the first place. So this is again another fundamentally underspecified problem. Mismatched objectives. Um, uh, Sherrod briefly also talked about how the reported crime is a proxy for how risky this individual might be, but we are limited to what we can see, the observable variables. And for example, in medical case, you may know some side effects of a particular pill, but you don't know whether a patient would rather have potential weight gain than have a potential depression. And what your good algorithms that is designed with good intentions may have side effects. So the field of machine learning, it, this is a one way to categorize interpretability methods. One is something that you can do before building any model. And this is a kind of uh, way to really dig into your data, understand your data, visualize it, look at the descriptive statistics to understand are, are we missing anything? Is there mislabels and, and maybe other problems? Second way is building a new model that has interpretability embedded in, inside of it. This is the case where if you have a power to replace existing model or you're maybe from starting from scratch. And unlike uh, some myth that, that you have to sacrifice the performance when you're pursuing interpretability, in my research I find often case that you may not have to. There are lots of interest, not lots of good solutions in your cost function that your classifier is trying to optimize, and you just have to pick the one that is both interpretable and high performing. But a lot of cases, and especially in industry, we don't have power to change the model. Often, case you're just given a model, maybe a lot, number of years of engineering effort went into it, so you can't really change the model but we still want to have improve interpretability and understand what this model is doing. So I'll briefly talk about my recent work called TCAF, how to improve interpretability post-training phase. TCAF is called testing with concept activation vectors. And in high level, this is keeping the following uh, agenda in mind. Testing how much any high level concept of your choice is affecting the model's prediction. What do I mean? Well, high-level concept can be race or gender or any other minority subgroups that you're interested in. And as long as you can give me some examples of what you mean by these concepts, so for example, if you're interested in gender, you give me some pictures of women and men, if you consider gender as a binary, and I can test how much this concept matter for model's prediction. So let me again, be a little more concrete. Let's say I build a classifier. Given a picture, uh, this classifier can tell me whether this is a doctor or not a doctor. Now, uh, let's call the probability of doctor, the, the, the score for a doctor, a doctor in this. 
I'm interested in whether the gender concept mattered in, this, in my classifier. For example, it, did it matter that this picture happens to have a woman in it? Did it affect the score of doctorness at all? TCAV is a tool that gets attached to the trained model and without changing the model, it's like a microscope. It can probe at this, uh, this model and uh, request the model to quantitatively answer how much this concept matter for, for this model, for, for this classification decisions. So in this, my toy example, it turns out that the fact that it was not a woman, the picture did not include a woman, mattered a lot. And the discrepancy between these two bar graphs shows us that, yeah, this concept actually played a big role in classification decision. And depending on what you want, this may or may not be a problem. For a little more technical folks, this is what we do. Uh, we take directional derivative with res of the logit layer, the score, the doctorness, with respect to a vector in the latent embedding space that represents this concept of gender. And you can learn this vector by using a couple of examples of what gender means. So we apply TCAV to two widely used image, image classification models. These are called Google Net or Inception B3. These are really high performing image classification network. It's like 1,000 classes with 95, 96% accuracy. That's pretty in impressive. And this is widely available, it's, uh, it's publicly available, it's free, so a lot of people use it as the backbone of their systems for many applications in the world. So we took these models and asked, uh, and created these high level concepts. As I said, you can do whatever concept that you want, so we tested with color concept, red, yellow, blue, green, race, and gender. And fire engine, ping pong ball, rugby ball, and egg bronze are one of the class labels in, this, in these models. So fire engine, we tested color, and the red concept is important for fire engine. It makes sense. Uh, green is important because a lot of fire engines were sitting on a grassy field. So this makes sense if you're from a country where fire engines are red. But in some parts in Australia, if maybe someone in the audience is from Australia, some parts, the fire engines are yellow. So this data set is actually ref reflecting some geographical bias. Uh, ping pong ball is, uh, the Asian race mattered a lot for a ping pong ball and some people don't really know why. And I grew up in Korea and I'm proud to say that we win a lot of gold medals in Olympic and table tennis. <laughs> so the training data set reflected this bias that a lot of pictures and contained Asian faces. It also makes sense that rugby ball, we don't really play rugby in Asia. So Caucasian and African American race comes out high. And these are not new results. These are previously qualitatively, uh, we had a suspicion that this network might be biased. So we had some qualitative results, but this is first time that we can confirm this quantitatively with numbers. So then we took this TCAV and went wild and applied to medical application. Diabetic retinopathy. So DR is a treatable disease that if you find early, but left untreated, you, it, it may not be recoverable. So given this image like this uh, on the right hand side, this retina image, people build a model to predict what level of DR you are in. And they were able to build a model with high accuracy, 85%. Now this is great, but as a doctor, you may wonder, well, I have this domain expert knowledge that, that I've been built and, and been educated. Um, I wonder if the model is using the same concept that I, have, I would have used. In other words, the concepts that machine learning model uses, is that consistent with the diagnostic concepts that doctors use? So that's the question that TCAV is trying to answer. Here is one of the prediction class, level four, this is this pretty severe uh, level of DR, model performs very well on this class. And TCAP scores shows that these green bars represent the concepts that doctors also look for when they're trying to diagnose DR uh, level four. The red is something that doctors think that shouldn't exist in level four. So yeah, it's consistent with doctor's knowledge and model is also looking at the concepts that doctor would have looked at. That's good. 
Story is a little different when model is performing less well. So DR level one is more mild level of DR. In this case, model confuses DR level one with DR level two, slightly severe, more severe level. And TCAP shows that model is looking at a concept, this HMA, it's a type of hemorrhage in your blood vessel. It's looking at concept that doctor don't really, doctors don't really look at. So there is some inconsistency. And this is not to say that this model is, is, is performing uh, not very well I and mean, we shouldn't use it. It's not, it's not about that. It's about enabling doctors to gain insights into how this model is working and decide when to use and when not to use, understanding better about weaknesses and strengths of this, of this classifier. So with that, I talked about uh, a method that can test your post-trained uh, trained model with any high-level concepts that of your choice. And I talked about how we might be able to use this technique to ensure machine learning models can reflect our values and our knowledge appropriately. With that, uh, I'll take any questions. We'll take any questions. Yeah. Thanks. Thank yeah, so we can, we can open the floor for Hi, I'm Ben Hancock. Um, I write for The Recorder in San Francisco. Brian, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your research and if you could maybe explain again um, when you were looking at how the model for, um, or how the, the thinking, so to speak, for autonomous car might change in different regions depending on the demographics and income levels. That was, I just wanted, I didn't quite follow that. Can you explain that a little more in depth and, and how to address that? Yeah, sure. So, so basically, um, as things currently stand, uh, when you get into a car accident, the legal system compensates you for a number of factors. Um, one is medical expenses. Uh, another is lost wages. Uh, so by virtue of the fact that you were put out of commission for six months, um, you, you, you are compensated for your lost wages. Um, and when you start looking at those two factors in particular um, and how they differ by, uh, by income or, uh, or socioeconomic status, um, then you would expect to see algorithms that are trained to minimize uh, legal liability in this context um, to, to be more risk averse in areas where they expected the compensation levels to be significantly higher. Um, so uh, if you're driving around, the example I used um, uh, just a few, a few minutes ago was if you're driving around in an upper crust Silicon Valley neighborhood, um, you have good reason to believe that any pedestrian that you detect on the street uh, probably comes from that neighborhood, uh, in which case uh, you would have good reason to uh, predict that in the event of an accident with that pedestrian, um, there would be a much higher expected uh, compensation. Uh, outcome than if you were in um, a neighborhood with uh, lower income residents. Um, now that is, now in virtually no one as a human driver takes that calculus into account. So the legal system's way it has compensated um, victims hasn't turned into a systemic uh, bias. Uh, However, if there's nothing done to address how that compensation currently happens, you would expect this kind of behavior to start to unfold. Once, the, once these systems get more sophisticated, then simply just like stay away from <laughs> any pedestrians, which is, sort of what th this, which is sort of what they're at right now. But the technology will become less rudimentary. You'll have more fine-grained sensory capabilities, and you'll actually uh, expect, you would expect companies to start making these kinds of profit maximizing decisions. Um, and if the legal system doesn't change, then that's, that's the incentive uh, that you would expect them to follow. The great news is that if you change that incentive, then the machines will act accordingly uh, in a way that you just can't expect in the human context. Uh, hi, I just wanted to say thanks to all the panelists. This is a super interesting uh, and important topic, so it's great hearing your input. I'm uh, Zach Harned. I'm a law student here with the AI and Law Society. 
Um, I love the work that Google Brain is doing on the feature of visualization and the like recent paper on the building blocks of interpretability. Like very cool stuff to a non-technical person like me. Uh, TCAV is also really neat. I had sort of two questions related to that. The first was I was curious how the model works in terms of, you know, you had identified certain features and then the ability to sort of check the weights of those features in the model. Uh, does it have to be a human being who selects the features they want to see in terms of the weights or does the model itself tell you here sort of the features? So I was curious how that works. Um, and also I thought I wanted to hear a little more about the sort of tension that I could see between wanting this interpretability, uh, say in the medical example for the doctors and knowing here's the particular features uh, that it's doing. Oh good, they map onto what the doctors are doing. That seems nice with the sort of uh, counterposing sort of tension between, well, the machines have these amazing capabilities. And in fact, sometimes to pick up on things that no doctor or human has done thus far, but is actually really predictive for the particular, you know, sort of measure we're looking for. And how do we try and balance those between it being interpretable by humans and also letting the machines surpass us in certain elements? Yeah, really good questions. So about the, the first question was about how do we choose concepts or uh, you call the features, uh, concepts, similar things. Uh, for the work that I did on it, it then presented here requires human to specify what the concept you want to test. And that could be seen as if you already have a dictionary of interesting high level concepts such as gender or any minority groups, that could be off, uh, you can use it off the shelf. But I see it, view it as more of a benefit of than, than the uh, more work for on the human side. Um, so, so yes, human has to choose it. However, we're working on something that could automate this, perhaps using some clustering method. Can we automatically detect uh, which are the, what are the set of examples that makes this model sensitive to? So that's on the works. Uh, for your second question, it's a really good question. So how do we, there are, I think, that can be divided into two different questions. Well, how do we interpret superhuman performing uh, machines like AlphaGo? Uh, it's amazing and it's doing something that human cannot interpret. It's doing amazing things. So, so that's cool, but should, we shouldn't stop that, right? Uh, for domains where the performance is your only goal, then it is not under specified problem domain. It's something that you know exactly what you're going for, in which case, yeah, I mean, you don't need interpretability for that sort of domain. Um, what is alarming, you mentioned that there are high performance machine learning models that just does stuff magically and should we. Um, it is, the, there's a one, one sentence that I really wanna say. Causation, correlation, not causation. Correlation, not causation. Right, so a lot of models are so good at picking up correlation. And we don't currently have uh, we have efforts to, we as in the machine learning community, as efforts to develop more causal models, but that's very difficult. If you think about humans, we don't even know exactly how one thing is caused by another factor. So building that model and having machines strictly focus on the causal factors is a very difficult task. So because of those dangers, and there are lots of medical examples, uh, for example, Lich Karana's work points at how the, um, there is this study, oh, this was toy example that Rich gave in his paper about if you're a pregnant woman, the model thinks that you have a pretty low risk of pneumonia. Now that's really wrong. If, it, it, that, you know, if, you're, woman, if you're pregnant, your immune system sort of shuts down and you're more vulnerable to these, uh, these sort of things. But why does, why does machine think that woman has low risk? Well, because if you're pregnant, you get a lot of medical attention. So chances are that you will be going to the hospital, you will be dis you discover this early, and you will be treated. So model things, yeah, you, if you're pregnant, you're fine. That's a correlation, not causation, right? and that's a problem. So because of those potential issues, uh, that we need to think about, think very carefully when we think about this tension, which way we want to be extra careful, in what cases we don't have to be as much. Thank okay. you. Thanks so much. My name is Roger Cohen, Strategic Legal Advisory. Um, my question is, if I buy my own autonomous vehicle and I own it, can I recalibrate so I can run over different people? <laughs> 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 
So that again, <laughs> that again goes to the question of, yeah, so who, who, who does the buck stop with? Um, so uh, there's a rich legal tradition of aftermarket modifications to uh, vehicles. Uh, <laughs> But, you, but the, the manufacturer themselves lose liability. Um, now, there are a lot of people that say uh, these things are never, these things are gonna be delivered in the sort of Uber and Lyft uh, format, the transportation network company format, uh, and that ownership is going the way of ownership of horses. Um, and I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced of that reality, but yes, so, uh, so but, but were they to be individually owned and individually modified, then it would sever the liability for uh, the company. But you would probably be in big, big trouble <laughs> yourself. Yeah. Hi, uh, Dirk Hartung from Materis Law School, Hamburg, Germany. First of all, uh, thank you. So many, so right things were said. The little statistician in me is profoundly happy at what you've just said. And, and actually, I love the creativity that you put into solving these problems. Now one question I have, um, for, probably for Brian, but maybe others of you can answer. Um, from what you've done, it looks a lot like if you have that model already, you could simulate different pieces of legislations or concepts addressing different kinds of liability and behaviors and then have a, um, I, I don't know what, what kind of simulation, maybe um, agent-based or something like that, to figure out what the best sort of regulation for autonomous vehicles would be if we want maximum application and maximum security. Is there anything in that direction you guys have been thinking about? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that that's the most important thing. So I, I think most people's reaction to the uh, kind of material that I just brought up in the slides is sort of doomsday-ish. Um, but it can be presented in a way that policymakers can make informed decisions. Um, so if you, prevent, if you present policymakers with an array of data um, that's actually empirically backed, um, then the decision that they ultimately come up with, whatever they're trying to optimize for, um, uh, is an informed one, rather than one that just happens in a sort of piecemeal way um, without a great deal of thought put into it and then becomes very difficult, difficult to sort of retroactively address. Um, I'll add one more thing. Uh, you, you said that optimized for maximum security and uh, there was one more thing. I think that's fundamentally underspecified problem again because it's hard to write down what is it that we're trying to optimize. But I think as a community we're trying to figure out those criteria. What would be sufficient? What would be enough? And we would need a lot of empirical evidence that that is enough. So once you have that, then it will be optimizable. Hi, uh, Gautam from LegalZoom. In uh, follow-up to his question, how is error correction uh, in machine learning for law different from machine learning for other you know, fields? Uh, because there are implications that are you know, beyond uh, what simple uh, machine learning does in, say, identifying photos or stuff. But like when you're interpreting law and you need to correct yourself, you know, the algorithm, how is that, you know, is there a difference or, or and I have a second question I'll ask later. Oh, I th the question was how is it different to correcting error in law versus machine learning? No, no, no. in machine learning for law versus machine learning for, for other law. areas. Oh, I see. Hmm. I think it's dep depending on what you're trying to optimize for. In, op in medical case, so in performance only, uh, in applications that where performance matters only, maybe uh, it's hard to find those domains, but just to throw something like stock, stock price, maybe your only goal is to optimize for performance. And there is the legal case where with really high stake, like the ones that Sherrod talked about, and there's a spectrum of things, applications in between. Uh, and depending on where you stand in this spectrum, the thing that you're trying to optimize may not be false positive, it may be something else. So it's case by case scenario. So I, I don't have a one concrete answer. What's the delta? Cool, Maybe I'll, I'll yeah. add one thing to that and say that I think in, in law, there are many applications where the problem is fundamentally underspecified and maybe more so than, than a lot of other domains. Um, just think of like disparate impact law. And so if you're searching for solutions and all you're optimizing for performance, you might have things that are more or less the same in terms of some you know, raw objective function, but some have more disparate impact than others. And we would think that we actually want the solution that has relatively little disparate impact. So that's just one example of underspecification. Um, so I think it's very similar to what, what Bean was saying. And my second question is for all of you. Um, 
You talked about codifying law into algorithms, but can we do the reverse? Can we make laws out of algorithms? And what you know, algorithms teach us? Can we then, then change the laws depending on what the algorithms have taught us? That's an interesting yeah. question. I think we need more data <laughs> uh, <laughs> to do that. Yeah, I think it's not impossible. Uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it, I mean, I would say one thing that comes out I mean, particularly in Brian's work is that it forces us to be very serious about what the incentives are that are codified in the law, because we can play out these extreme scenarios and say, well, you know, this is a law. What's the natural equilibrium of this law? If we were to have some kind of optimized algorithm, and then that forces us to think, well, what kind of laws should we have? Which not only is guarding it against the extreme algorithms, but perhaps enforcing some sort of internal logical consistency. And there's some work in machine learning to do exactly that. We have some super performing uh, networks, and we're trying to reverse engineer to see, can we teach doctors? Can we teach chess players? There's some effort into that. Cool, thank you. Uh, my name's Peter Darling, and I'm from Zero. We're a legal tech startup in Los Gatos, and this question kind of piggybacks on your answer and is primarily directed at Brian. In the autonomous vehicle scenario you just described, where it's engineered into the algorithm that it should, to some extent, aim more for the low uh, liability target rather than the high liability one, it's a sloppy way of making my point, but you understand what I'm driving at. Doesn't that reshape the whole definition of negligence in the first place? If under tort law negligence is a failure to, to exercise reasonable due care, if that failure is engineered into the device itself, then you're almost injecting a degree of intentionality that makes it not negligence, but something else. It's not deliberate, and it's not strict liability, but it's a whole new class of liability or action definition that means basically restructuring tort law from the ground up. I mean, you can't apply tort law written for humans to a machine if the machine is programmed to act like a slightly irresponsible human with respect to a particular <laughs> Point. Yeah. Comments? Yeah, so um, so already tort law doesn't do a great job of translating into the driver context, and that's why we have a kind of labyrinth of traffic codes and roadway infrastructure that's helped humans navigate with this incredibly useful technology that's also incredibly uh, dangerous if misapplied. So, um, so in, in 1896, the first horseless carriage uh, rumbled around in Detroit. It took them 20 years to uh, invent a stop sign. Um, and, so, and so there's nothing that says it's negligence on the law of the books of the hand formula to run a stop sign, but it's just evolved over time to be negligence per se to run a stop sign. Now you can overturn that presumption of negligence if you are dashing to get your pregnant wife to the hospital, for example. Right, sure. um, but so we've sort of routinized this really abstract notion of negligence, which weighs these really abstract notions of burden and loss and probability right. um, into a kind of formulaic context um, that humans can codify and humans can understand. And what we'll probably need is neither a products liability nor a negligence regime, but a hybrid of the two going forward that kind of grapples with these incredibly complex questions in a way that society did with the mainstream uh, rise to prominence. And, of. and with sort of a whole different set of ethical assumptions baked into them. That's right, yeah. yeah. And, so, and so we can then test those ethical assumptions empirically because these these things have really rich data logging capabilities, um, and then th and then the law can change. Going back to that, going back to that other question. Got it. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Alex Nelson. I'm uh, uh, with Comply LLC, which is a small startup in Austin, Texas. Um, I have a question, but first uh, an anecdote for you that I think is funny. Uh, when I, about six years ago when I was first practicing, I um, did a DUI and speeding trial. And the law in Colorado where I come from says that the speed limit is the presumptively reasonable speed to drive. So I argued to the judge that uh, officers shouldn't have pulled my client over because she was, she was driving 10 over, but there was no traffic, so it was reasonable for her to be you know, driving that speed on this uh, straight piece of road. And, uh, she didn't buy it. So. <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, my, my question is for all of you, but, but I think relates particularly to Ms. Kim's um, topic. And that is uh, what, that you, you, your example is related 
particularly to image recognition, I believe, um, facial recognition and, and color, color recognition um, in the context of the fire truck um, and, and racial uh, composition of people uh, in sport photos. Is it different? Can you talk at all about the difference uh, between the use of machine learning to correlate those types of concepts versus more abstract concepts such as um, in the legal field, the correlation of, of uh, you know, discussion of one abstract legal concept with another abstract legal concept. For example, um, a, a professional person uh, have, having some type of advanced education corresponding with their being exempt from overtime, uh, overtime law under employment law. Mm, interesting. Uh, so for as long as those concepts is reflected in any way in the data, it is, it, we can learn that concept. In other words, I talked a lot about image network. So a more educated person, uh, maybe there are some uh, clothes that they wear or the way that they present themselves, if it's, for example, a video, the language they speak. If there are things that, that can, be, can reflect that concept, then it is, it is workable. Um, it also, I should mention that it works well on a very rich network. What do I mean by that is that it learned from many, many different examples and it had to learn very uh, fine-grained representations of the world. So for instance, if I just train a classifier between cat and dog, well, even simpler, cat and tree, they're very different. So I don't need to know very much about the world to classify these two. But if I had to classify, um, who was it? Malmad and Siberian Husky. These two dogs look pretty much the same to me, but they're different. Mm -hmm. The way they're like very slight different, the experts can tell. If I'm training a network to classify these two, then, then they had to learn very rich representation of the world. So to answer to your question, one, it's doable if it's reflected in the feature space, and two, you, you would definitely want some very rich network. Um, good morning, my name is Deepankar and I'm from India. I'm, I run a legal tech company which works in legal analytics in income tax. And my question is uh, to Sharad as well as to Ben. Um, you talked about you know, inherent biases and you talked about the high level concepts which need to be tested to see whether the model has inherent biases. So, my, so for, for us, we are building classifiers, let's say, uh, which, would, which would be able to classify whether uh, a particular business expense should be allowed for an industry or not. Now the case laws, when they describe the factors as to what leads to an allowable exemption and what is not, they never mention the income of the income of the SSE being one factor. But we all know, as as India being a vast country with a lot of taxpayers and uh, the tax service having uh, lesser resources, they probably go after cases where the SSE has a high income than than after small businesses. So while we try and build a classifier which is based on precedents and case laws, there may be situations where somebody may be able to get away with an exemption in a low income situation and not, not get away with the same exemption, being in the same industry and claiming exemption for same kind of transaction just because they're a high, high net worth business. And that would, that would really change the way we recommend to our clients as to what they should do in a given situation. So the question is whether, do we have guidance as to what we should test for? Because if you want to test for income of the SSE data, then that data needs to be extracted, which is a large commercial effort for us. So that's, that's really the question. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll have a, a, a quick comment on this, and but it does seem like something that Bean could answer. The, the first is, what are you trying to predict? Are you trying to predict empirically what's the likelihood that this, that this person is at risk, which is different than the question of, are they actually in violation of some law? And this goes to this question of underspecification. Um, so I think that's, I mean, maybe I'll just leave that comment and, yeah, and, Brian, and, and Brian also is. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, I think the underspecification thing is a is a really big uh, problem and opportunity. Um, so the the legal system has all kinds of placeholders. Um, this is slightly orthogonal to your point, but so, so reasonableness is one in the autonomous vehicles context. It's come up a number of times. 
we just don't know. We don't know what exactly it is. You should follow another car a reasonable distance. Um, machi machines actually have to define that, um, and they can. It can be defined in a number of different ways, um, and you can see what outcomes unfold, and then you can use those outcomes to make arguments for defining it in a different way, um, and uh, and depending on if. If, if those arguments get traction, then you can expect to see uh, you can expect to see change. I don't know if that's a great answer to. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay, we're getting we're getting the word, so we have to. Wrap. So we'll be we'll be around to answer questions if there are more questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm.